All right, we're back. We're continuing our story now. So we've heard about how our action potential is zipping down the axon, and it's headed towards those skeletal muscle fibers so that uh, they can receive the signal to contract. So now we're going to talk about, well, how do you get this communication that happens between the motor neuron and the muscle fibers? So this leads us to events that are going to happen at our neuromuscular junction. This is where the... Uh, the ends of the axons, kind of like this is not heavily magnified here, but you've got um, a motor neuron, a couple of motor neurons living up here in the spinal cord, axons extending outward, branching out, and contacting these muscle fibers. And like they're showing you here on the diagram, one motor neuron does not control every muscle cell in a whole scale of a muscle. There are going to be a whole bunch of motor neurons that control um, various fibers or muscle cells within a whole muscle. So they're showing you a couple of different examples there. But where those axon terminals or synaptic knobs that we saw earlier when we were going over uh, motor neurons where they branch out and form junctions with the muscle fiber membrane. Those are called neuromuscular junctions. And incidentally, those uh, axons of your motor neurons, you know, that are traveling all the way from the spinal cord or the brain stem down to some skeletal muscle somewhere, they're going to be bundled up inside your nerves. So if those nerves are branching off with the uh, spinal cord, remember we call those spinal nerves. If they're branching off parts of the brain, the brain stem, they're called cranial nerves. Okay, so let's move on. We'll take a closer look at our neuromuscular junction. This is a pretty nice little diagram from your textbook. And so here they're showing you, all right, you've got axon here. And just as it gets really close to a muscle fiber, it makes some little branches. And at the ends of each of those branches, you're going to have a widened area. That widened area is called the synaptic knob or an axon terminal is another name. I think that's the name your textbook prefers to use. All right, and those little knob areas here are blown up in greater detail. So you got one of those knobs and then over here this is going to be your skeletal muscle fiber membrane or the sarcolemma if you remember that from an earlier lecture here in the unit. Alright so action potential has zipped all the way down that axon and it's also going to spread across all of those branches. So now over here on the magnified side action potential is spreading in a wave across that whole synaptic knob. And then here's where the next part of the story is going to come in. As that action potential arrives down there at the axon terminal or that synaptic knob, there are calcium channels. They've got a couple of them drawn in. They're going to be more than two. They're really going to be all over the cell membrane there. Um, the action potential causes calcium channels to swing open. So just like we had sodium and potassium channels swinging open earlier, down here you have calcium channels. They are sensitive to that change in voltage. Okay, so when the voltage hits plus 30, because you've had your action potential down there, these calcium channels open. Those calcium channels are membrane proteins, just like uh, the sodium and the potassium channels. They open up and they're going to let calcium ions, which have a double positive charge, flow inside the synaptic knob. Alright, so in Unit 3 I kept harping on how important calcium ions were for the function of your nervous and muscular systems. Well, here it is. Here's the first example of their major importance. You gotta have these calcium ions flowing into those axon terminals in order to have signaling take place. Okay, so inside, why is the calcium coming in there? The calcium ions are coming in there because within those axon terminals, um, we have stored in there a chemical called acetylcholine. 
abbreviated as ACH. Acetylcholine is an example of a neurotransmitter. Neurotransmitters are signaling molecules that neurons secrete and in Unit 5 we'll see a whole lot more examples of neurotransmitters because there are, are various types that are used for different communication needs but acetylcholine is the type that is secreted from motor neurons. Secreted from those axon terminals. Okay, and then across over on the sarcolemma of your muscle fiber you're going to have acetylcholine receptors okay so those are also proteins and they're sitting in the membrane of the muscle fiber or the sarcolemma and they receive the acetylcholine signals acetylcholine and acetylcholine receptors come together um, like magnets or like a lock and a key. They have a, a perfect fit for each other. Let's take a look at this on a picture so we can see it a little bit better. And of course, there are some beautiful animations from your textbook publishers, which I will show you. I'm going to skip over to this slide. You've got some things written out there on the PowerPoint that can uh, help you with some of the terminology and not having to take quite as many notes as we're going through this. Okay, so this diagram is showing you in more detail what's happening here. Okay, so our action potential reached the synaptic knob. Those calcium ions flow in through those calcium channels, those voltage-gated calcium channels that opened up. Alright, so inside the synaptic knob, these little things that you see here, those are vesicles with your ACH, your acetylcholine. Okay, so remember vesicles from back in uh, uh, chapter three when we were learning a little bit about what goes on inside cells. Those are little membrane cover compartments that store acetylcholine. When the calcium comes in, okay, when the calcium comes in, there's step three. What that does is it causes those vesicles to move towards the membrane of the axon terminal or synaptic knob. Okay, and then they fuse, the membranes of those vesicles fuse with the cell membrane and that dumps out the acetylcholine. All those little green spots you see there are acetylcholine. Okay, so you had to have that calcium influx to trigger the acetylcholine being released. Let me erase all this stuff. And we'll continue on. Okay, then continuing on with our diagram here. Um, the little green dots, your acetylcholine, they flow across the space that you have there between the axon terminal and the sarcolemma. And again, that little space you have in there is called the synapse or the synaptic cleft. because it really forms a little indentation there in the sarcolemma. That's a gel-filled space. So your axon terminal and your sarcolemma don't actually make contact. You've got a little gap there that's used to keep them separated. That's important because if they weren't separated, uh, you wouldn't really have any way, it would not be um, as easy to control the signaling between your motor neurons and your muscle fibers. You don't want them actually physically making contact. That allows you to turn on and turn off the signaling that takes place more easily. Okay, so within the sarcolemma, the little purple things we see there, we're probably starting to get used to purple things in cell membranes being membrane proteins that have various kinds of jobs. So blown up over here in that part of the picture, the little green dots are acetylcholine molecules have attached to their receptors. In purple, that's your acetylcholine receptor. And guess what happens? When the acetylcholine binds the acetylcholine receptor, it, it opens up a channel 
within the receptor. So the acetylcholine receptor does multiple things. It binds acetylcholine when that gets released from the synaptic knob up there. And then once that happens, it opens up a channel. And that channel actually lets sodium in and potassium out. However, there's more sodium that comes in than potassium that goes out. Okay, so what's happening to the, ch uh, the charge across the membrane of our muscle fiber here? So down in here, where we have, we're letting more sodium in and a little bit of potassium out, but way more sodium in, muscle fiber membrane is just like a motor neuron membrane. It's going to be well below zero it's going to start to do what? It's going to start to depolarize, just like what we had happen on our, uh, on our motor neuron. <clears throat> All right. I'm going to continue the story over here, and then I'll flip back over to that uh, other slide. Okay, so what they're showing you here on this diagram from your textbook, you've started to depolarize your muscle fiber membrane. Okay, so this is your sarcolemma or your muscle fiber membrane here. You started to depolarize just like what we had happen in the motor neuron. You're temporarily more positively charged inside and more negatively charged outside. Well, guess what? You have voltage gated sodium channels sitting in the uh, sarcolemma just like we had in the motor neuron. That's going to, they open up when you reach threshold. Sodium ions come rushing in just like what we had occur in the motor neuron. So just like what happened in the motor neuron, you're going to start out down here way below zero. You go up to plus 30 and then you reset. So you have an action potential, just like what happened in the motor neuron. And then it's going to spread from one location to the next to the next along the muscle fiber membrane, just like what we saw with the motor neuron. So you've got this um, muscle fiber, this long cylinder-shaped cell, and this action potential starts to spread in a wave. You have this electrical change that occurs all the way across the membrane there. All right, so we don't want this happening forever. We go back over here. Well, let's stay here for a second because this is more blown up for us. Okay, so if we keep having acetylcholine over here traveling out of the synaptic knob and attaching to its receptors over here, guess what's going to happen? You're going to keep having action potential, action potential, action potential. You're going to keep um, that wave of electrical signaling traveling across your muscle fiber. So in order to make that stop, you know, as you know, you don't want muscle fibers contracting all the time. They have to contract and relax, relax when needed. So we need to get rid of this acetylcholine because as long as that acetylcholine, that neurotransmitter is in the synapse, this synaptic cleft over here, if it's there, you're going to keep stimulating this muscle fiber to contract. So we need to get rid of our acetylcholine. And how that happens, there is an enzyme, there are enzymes that are present in the synaptic cleft, and those are called, they have a really long name, oops, I'm still on my eraser there, they're called acetylcholine esterase. And what that does, those are enzymes that take acetylcholine and they split it into acetic acid and choline. So you're taking that bigger molecule acetylcholine esterase and you split it in half, basically. It's probably not literally in half, but you split it into two smaller molecules. Acetic acid, incidentally, is vinegar. That's what you have. Vinegar is just diluted acetic acid that we, uh, that we eat, but you also produce it inside your body as well. 
Okay, so once that happens, you're getting rid of these acetylcholine molecules. They get degraded, and uh, then the motor neuron quits stimulating the uh, muscle fiber to uh, have an action potential on it. Okay, so these enzymes are always around down there in the synaptic cleft. So if this motor neuron up here is going to keep stimulating our muscle fiber, it's got to keep sending more and more and more acetylcholine out um, in order to make that happen. And if you're going to keep sending more and more acetylcholine out, you got to keep sending action potentials down the motor neuron. So it's not just a one-time thing. If, if a motor neuron, sometimes you got to keep contracting your muscles, a motor neuron is going to send action potential, action potential, action potential, action potential, action potential, so that you can keep this whole stimulation thing going with your uh, with your muscle fiber. All right, let me back up over here for a second. Yeah, so this just has written out on it what I was just talking about. Um, you don't acetylcholine does not just last there in the. Uh, synaptic cleft for very long. It's quickly degraded by acetylcholine esterase. So even the acetylcholines that already attach to the receptor, they're going to get broken down as well. And then that helps control, that prevents ongoing muscle fiber contraction. Because again, um, this signaling that's taking place, what we're trying to get to is muscle fiber contraction. All right, that picture is showing you the repolarization occurs along the muscle fiber membrane um, just like it does in the motor neuron. So when you're going to repolarize, you got to reset. You close those sodium channels and you open up your voltage-gated potassium channels just like we had two video lectures ago and that resets the muscle fiber membrane so you go back to a normal state. Okay, so we've now seen that we have an action potential spreading in a wave go away pen, across the muscle fiber membrane. Um, now how in the world does that actually lead to muscle fiber contraction? We're still trying to get to the contraction state. So this occurs through something called excitation contraction coupling. Excitation refers to the motor neuron secreted acetylcholine and stimulated an action potential on the muscle fiber. That's excitation. The muscle fiber membrane is excited. Um, how does that lead to the contraction inside the muscle fiber? That's going to be the second part, so we'll talk about that in the next video lecture.